Hi there and welcome to our monthly State of Play. If you're watching this, it's because you're a member of our community and you're really laser focused on keeping your finger on the pulse of what's happening in the market. And as we all know, we had a rate rise yesterday. And then the week before that, you may have noticed a lot of talk in the press about falling property prices. So there was um, tongues wagging, there were tongues wagging that we were at um, the fastest drop in history um, and we haven't seen prices fall that fast since 1983. So what we did see is um, an announcement from CoreLogic that um, we had seen nearly 29% growth or price increase and then um, a fall nationally of 3.5% um, from when prices peaked in April. And of course the Reserve Bank announced its first rate rise in May and then then we've just seen consecutive rises since then. And by big amounts, like half a percent, normally it's just 0.25% is usually historically how much they'll raise in increments. CoreLogic's National Home Value Index also came out this week and it um, recorded declines across the board for the fourth consecutive month in August. Um, and it's accelerating around the country. So it started in Sydney and then moved to Melbourne. Um, so nationally, we're down 1.6%. And as we said, that's the fastest fall since 1983. That's a pretty big deal because um, back in 1983, we had hadn't even deregulated our financial system. That happened in 1985. So we had a set currency and it was a completely different economic world. Um, so big things happening, massive change right now. Let's have a look at um, how prices have fallen around the country. So we can see Sydney's down 2.3% for August alone. Um, we see nationally 1.6%. Um, Sydney's down nearly 6% for the quarter. Melbourne is 3.8% for the quarter. Brisbane that was having really good growth has now fallen. Um, and um, on the whole though, we're still ahead um, for um, our total um, increase in value over time, except for the Sydney market. So the question people are posing now is, are we in a market that is crashing? Um, we can see that we were in a market of huge growth over the last year, 21.3% um, growth um, in November last year. Um, and this year, we're only at 2.2% growth, but values have fallen in Sydney and Melbourne compared to where they were this time last year. Despite all this weakness, we're still ahead of the curve. So if we look back to when the pandemic first struck in March 2020, um, we're still 15% higher across the board than we were then, except for Melbourne. And remember, Melbourne had extensive problems economically and lockdowns. Um, so their property market didn't boom quite so much as the rest of the country. Um, so even if we fell 15% peak of April to trough, the lowest point of the market, um, we're not going to see blood in the streets in the property market because CoreLogic says most people would have had at least 10% skin in the game, their own equity already. So they're not going to be underwater in their properties. Uh, that means that the debt, the money they owe the bank for their mortgage is more than the value of the property. That's what happened in the US in the global financial crisis. Um, and uh, a lot of people just gave their keys back to the bank. And then that caused the whole property market to just collapse because um, there was so much distress. So unlikely to be that sort of whole scale collapse where property prices drop 50% or so, but definitely a decline. And I can already feel your ears pricking up saying, well, maybe now might be the time to buy. Let's Let's look at a bit more of the data before we make decisions. Um, so Tim Lawless, head of research at CoreLogic and the go-to guy for this sort of stuff, says that from current levels, interest rates are likely to increase by at least in his view, another 0.75% basis points. Um, and there will be more stock coming on the market because traditionally people put their properties on the market for spring and there are fewer buyers because people are really 
really fearful at the moment and they don't want to take risks. They're waiting for the market to bottom out. Unfortunately, though, no one rings a bell at the bottom of the market, do they? So we don't know when that's going to be. Um, and the idea really in a moving market is we can't have a crystal ball. We can't make decisions, but we should look at data um, the way it is. So let's have a look at supply and demand. The trend at the moment is that there is more stock on market. So there is 13.4% higher um, properties on the market than there was a year ago. In other words, 13.4% more listings and 6.5% um, more than the five-year average. Um, this is probably not because, um, for example, uh, that there is more property actually coming on, but that there are fewer buyers, so it's sitting there longer. Um, there are 11.3% more homes available for sale compared to this time last year. We're in lockdown, of course, this time last year. And Sydney and Melbourne, where the downturn is more advanced, are already seeing advertised stock levels rising. Um, and this is going to happen even more as more spring properties come on the market. Um, and as we said, that's due to falling demand rather than everyone running to put their houses on the market. The listings are probably normal, just fewer buyers. Um, so what we did see is that, um, it, and this was from CoreLogic data, over the three months to August 2022, um, we were down 14.8% um, in terms of sales from the same period last year. Um, and that's uh, pretty big because we were in lockdown and a lot of people couldn't even view or buy properties this time last year. Um, but if you look at the Sydney market, 35% fewer sales. Canberra, nearly 19% fewer sales than this time last year. And Melbourne, 16.5%. Um, there were more listings on the market this winter than any other winter period um, and less buying activity, just low consumer sentiment because of uncertainty. Um, and we're going to see advertised stock rise because of spring. Um, we're also so um, going to not see a whole scale collapse of a property market because our unemployment rate is so low and probably going to go lower. In other words, everyone's earning money, everyone's got jobs. It's not like the GFC where people couldn't afford their mortgages and people were getting laid off like they were in the States and just walking away and locking the door and sending the keys to their property back to the bank. So um, we're also seeing people earning a bit more um, and we're unlikely to see everyone go to hell in a handbasket and a material increase in massive distressed listings. There are, however, more distressed properties um, coming on the market, but that's because of the backlog during COVID um, and when banks allowed deferrals of payments, all of that um, just didn't hit the legal system. So we've got three years worth coming through now. Uh, we have seen, um, a net, we're not going to see negative equity at the moment because uh, property prices went up nearly 30% over the last two years. So even if we fell 20%, we're still ahead pre-COVID values. So unless, um, and this did happen, a lot of buyers bought in a rising market um, and, you know, if they bought in the last six months or 12 months, um, they would have borrowed a lot. So they're the people who are really going to be feeling the pinch and the pain right now. If we look at the change in dwelling values on a rolling graph for the last quarter, we can see the numbers there. Sydney's the purple line down nearly 6% and Melbourne is the red line. Um, and that trend started the domino effect in Sydney and has moved around the country. If we look at the RBA announcement yesterday, uh, the governor of the Reserve Bank, Philip Lowe, said that um, the interest rates were increased by half a percentage point to 2.35% to bring inflation down. So um, he said that he needed to do that to balance out our economy. And it's far more important to have stable prices than runaway inflation um, and to make sure that we keep employment uh, high. In other words, 
words that our unemployment rate continues to fall. He did say that this isn't the end. They expect further interest rates increases over coming months to the end of the year. But he's not going to say that it's half a percent every time. He's saying that um, he doesn't think they're there yet in curbing inflation. Um, his talk track was a little bit what they call dovish. They talk about being hawkish and dovish. So dovish means that um, he talks about um, he, he's a little bit mollified and not so drastic. When they're hawkish, they want to scare people. Like with their talk track, uh, they want to have people stop spending and just be afraid without having to raise the interest rates. Um, what he's saying now is, look, I had to raise them, but don't get too worried and it doesn't mean they'll be rising forever and it doesn't mean we're on a predetermined course where they're going to just be massive chunks of rate rises every time. So some economists have said, look, that's good news um, for people worried about rate rises. He's kind of indicating that they intend to taper them off. That's what economists and analysts had to say anyway. So um, what uh, most economists priced into the market was that rates currently at 2.35% will hit the 3.2% mark um, and will peak at 3.8% by the middle of next year. Um, the JP Morgan chief economist, Ben Jarman, said that um, when they talk about normalising rates, um, he he sees that the Reserve Bank are going to taper off the rates. And what he expected, and it's broadly consistent with other economists, was another 50% basis point hike next month for October, and then 25 um, basis point increase for November, and then settling down into Christmas and the end of the year. And they'll pause and assess, um, because it's been so rapid fire and so dramatic, they'll pause and assess what happens after that. Um, and they'll just leave it in a holding pattern. We do know, though, that interest rates have mirrored um, what's happened with property prices. So um, if you look at this graph here, interest rates, um, you can see from that bottoming out, that extended yellow line, the 0.1% official rate from uh, late 2020, um, it stayed that low. It started to rise earlier this year, April, May this year, and you can see the blue line, which is how Housing prices has an inverse effect started to drop um, around that time as well. If you look at it in perspective, though, historically, this graph shows us that we're still pretty low. Um, we're back to where we were um, pre-COVID, um, probably about 2012, 13 rates, so post GFC, a little bit higher, but um, not blood in the streets high, and certainly not um, the average rate of where interest rates normally sit. The reason why there's all this talk around the property market it has to do with the fact that most Australians store most of their wealth in property. Um, it's the biggest source of wealth in our economy, sitting at $9.7 trillion now. So if you wanted to have an impact on an economy, and that's what the Reserve Bank does in setting interest rates and its monetary policy, they say, how can we make people spend more. If we lower rates, rates are the price of money. If interest rates are lower, then people are encouraged to borrow money and spend it. People aren't rewarded for saving it. You don't get much in a term deposit. So they're going to go out and spend, create economic activity and have inflation. Inflation is a good thing in moderation, the Reserve Bank says. So they lowered rates to try and stimulate or kickstart the economy in the pandemic. And then the aftermath of the pandemic and floods and supply chain issues and war in Ukraine meant that we had price increases that were unnatural. So inflation went through the roof because of a global effect as well as nationally, and it had a knock-on effect. And what that meant was suddenly we had labour shortages, everyone had jobs, people were out, people were working, people were spending and fueling the economy. And the Reserve Bank said, we don't want it to grow too fast. 
we need to dampen it. They said rates were at 0.1% for so long because of a pandemic and a one in a hundred year event. Now we need things to be more normalized. So they started raising rates pretty fast so that inflation didn't run away. They call it the inflation genie. And once you let it out of the bottle and prices go ballistic, it's hard to rein them back in. So how do we stop people spending? The Reserve Bank says we raise rates because if we want to affect most people in the economy, if we want to affect their purse strings so that they stop spending money and fueling inflation, we raise the cost of money. That means people will be rewarded for not spending for putting it in banks and saving it. And they'll have less to spend on discretionary things like restaurants and investments and things that aren't necessities. They'll be hoarding all their money for the necessities, things like their mortgage and their petrol and their food. Um, and once they've spent all their finite income, they can't go out and spend it on other stuff. So that'll just cool things down. That's what they're aiming to do. It's a fine line to balance that out, but most people will own property property or live in property, aspire to own property. So if you can impact property market and the, the amount they spend on their debt and their mortgage, you're going to affect a lot of the population. Um, because if you look at where they store wealth, it is massively more than any other sector in our economy. If you can hit property and affect the property market, then that's going to have the biggest impact and move the needle the most. So we can see if we look at that graph, property prices $9.7 trillion in residential real estate, $3.3 trillion in superannuation, $2.7 trillion. Um, and we can get that slide up there now, guys. That'd be great. Um, $2.7 trillion in all of the listed stocks um, on the stock ASX, on the total stock market, and $1.3 trillion in commercial real estate. So if you want to impact the most people, um, you're going to want to hit residential real estate, which is what they've done with the latest rate rise. Um, so we can see 2.35% um, is where rates sit now, um, but historically still really low, below the 10-year, 20, 30-year average, if we look at that core logic graph there. So definitely not blood in the streets and definitely not on a preset path, the Reserve Bank governor said. But what is happening at the coalface with property prices. So over the last three months, across the board, Australian property prices have fallen 3.4% um, and 4.7% over the last 12 months. Um, the biggest falls have been in the capital city housing market, especially Sydney and Melbourne. Um, and we can see the three month change there on that graph. And we can see um, the relative capital cities and regional areas there and how they've been impacted. Some have even grown. Um, if we look at the last 12 months across the board, um, we can see uh, there's more growth than falls. In fact, the only falls have been in Sydney and Melbourne, and um, we're still up 2.2% in values over the last 12 months, so not in negative territory just yet, but more rate rises to come, we hear. Um, total listings relatively low, just crossed the line now from the lowest point last year. So um, you can see the red line is 2021, um, but still historically low compared to the five year average. Um, so it's a dark line at the bottom. Um, if we look at the 28 days, so the month that was August, the last 28 days, property prices nationally are down 1.6%. And that's what they said in a month to fall 1.6% on average across the country. That's a pretty big fall, um, biggest since 1983. If we look at a granular level, you can see the Sydney market there, um, down 2.3% for the month of August, nearly 6% for the quarter, um, and 2.5% over the last 12 months. Because it rose so rapidly um, over the last 12 months and the first half of the year until April, um, we were seeing rising prices in Sydney. Melbourne market down 1.2% for the month, nearly 4% for the quarter and 2% uh, just for the last year. 
Brisbane is still up a long way for the last 12 months, 17.5%, um, but down nearly 2% for the month of August. So they've really caught the virus there of falling house prices. In Adelaide, um, it's still massively up for the year, 21.8%, but just in the month of August, tipped the scales into negative territory at 0.1%. Perth down 0.2%, so not much for the month of August um, and still up over the last 12 months, nearly 5%. Hobart up nearly 6% over the last 12 months, but down 1.7% for the month. I feel like a weather girl here. Um, Darwin up 0.9% for the month, so still growing in Darwin and up over 6% for the year. And Canberra down 1.7% for August, but up 7.8% for the year. Um, and we've seen those 12 month changes there for the, um, the on average across the nation. We've also seen compared to that rental markets rise as well. So renters are paying 10% more, which may entice property investors back into the market for buy and hold and cash flow strategies, but definitely um, pulling on people's purse strings there because they're paying higher rents, higher mortgages, just the cost of living is much higher due to inflation, which those rising rates are trying to address. If we look at credit data, we can see the variable rates there, um, as well as fixed rates um, for longer periods, three years plus and under three years. And we can see those same rates for investors. So slightly higher if it's not your principal place of residence. Um, and that's what you're actually paying. Most people are actually paying to the bank. So still lower. Um, than the five-year average or the 10-year average. Um, and there's our listings there again. So we're still, if we take all that data into account, what's happened is that property prices have reached their peak and are falling, and that's happening nationally. And it's happened at the same time as rates were rising. So those two will always have an inverse effect. What do we know, uh, as much as we can know for a fact, is that rates probably have further to go. Inflation probably has further to rise, but things don't go up forever. They come down. And most economists are predicting for that turning point to be um, around the middle of next year at the latest. So there is a window there of six to eight months that we're going to be going through this pain. Now, as we said, no one rings a bell at the bottom of the market. So many people are waiting on the sidelines, hoping to get a break. Um, buyers are not anxious anymore. There's no urgency about it. Buyers are being really cheeky um, and sellers aren't desperate. A lot of sellers are holding back because as we said, there's not blood in the streets yet. Sellers aren't feeling like, oh, I've got to rush on the market. It's not like the share market where they feel they have to sell or they'll be left holding the baby and, and with a dud investment that they can't get rid of. Um, prices have gone up so dramatically over the last year that people are not panicking yet. However, there will be opportunities in this market. Um, the opportunities will be different than those we've seen over recent years. Remember, when you looked at those graphs, we saw interest rates really, really low for so long, like literally since the GFC. And we're now getting back to the point where they're level with pre-GFC and rising above that point. So if we look to the past to look at what works in a down market, there are some little use strategies. Little use because they just haven't been popular um, in recent times because of the state of the market. So what we did in the past is not going to work, at least in the coming eight to 10 months. Um, different strategies will see much greater successes though. So what happened in the last year or two is that we all rushed to one side of the boat, nearly capsized the boat. Prices shot up. Everyone was desperate. Take my money. They were looking for yield because they weren't getting it in term deposits. They were looking to invest in property. You had to compete with 20 other people to buy a property, often paying well over the asking price just to secure it. So we chased a rising market. Now that it's a falling market, the strategy for most property entrepreneurs is, well, I'll just wait. Oh, should I buy now? But what if it's not the low point? What if it goes even lower? Unfortunately, markets are really driven by people's 
fear and people's greed. So when the market took off like a rocket, we were all greedy. Now we're kind of all fearful. Um, so we're doing nothing. And the irony of that is it's times of change and massive change, like pandemics, one in a hundred year events, that you see massive changes in markets, like the property market just went up nearly 30% in a year. So what does that mean now? We're going through a time of massive change. Haven't had rates like this and a market like this since 1983 um, for the property market to fall so fast. And interest rates haven't been like this for over 10 years. In fact, since records were kept, we've never seen four or five consecutive rate rises that we're seeing now of big chunks of half a percent. So. What does that mean and what strategies do we use if the strategies of the past are not working now? There are things that will work now. So I'm gonna share the top three with you now on our state of play. These are my top picks. Um, and the reason we all love property is because it's bricks and mortar, it's reliable over time, it's not so vol volatile, and we have far more control over it, don't we? Um, we can renovate it, we can sell it, we can rent it. There are lots of options. So how to do property in an uncertain falling market like this with rising rates. My number one pick is splitter blocks. If you haven't heard of splitter blocks, they are blocks that when they released new land, like back in the day, maybe even the 1800s, um, they, re they released lots and people could buy the land. And a lot of people, instead of buying one lot, they might have bought two blocks or three blocks or even five blocks. They might have put a house on one, yard on the rest, um, orchards or whatever they had back in the day. And it's always retained a title as two, three, four separate lots. In other words, to subdivide those properties, you don't need a DA, you don't need a surveyor to create new boundaries. They are already separate titles. You may have seen that in addresses. People might live at number 48 to number 50. They have two blocks of land. And often a splitter block has a property just on one title alone, and the other is just vacant land, maybe a tennis court or a yard or something else. Um, so they are a great opportunity because it's a whole lot faster. You don't have all the costs of a subdivision, which can be very significant. You don't have all that time in council, the red tape, um, everybody else you need. It's a simple process for a conveyancer to separate um, a title. And um, the great thing with splitter blocks is it gives you opportunity to hedge your bets or have an each way bet. Um, so what we're seeing, and that's fortunate um, here because we've got a lot of perspective perspective nationally with thousands of people across the country. Um, so we see what positions people for success. So there's a lot of renovators in our community and it's hard to hit a moving target with a renovation, isn't it? Because if you buy it for what is a good price now, what if the market falls further? And if you're aiming for a five figure profit, even like a 50, 60, $70,000 profit, that's not insignificant. If the market falls significantly or the time factor with construction costs and trades and supply chain issues, um, that can easily eat up your profit. Time is money in property when you're adding value through renovation. So renovation strategies can work, but the uncertainty, I agree, is scary. It can be hit and miss and your profit can be absorbed when you're buying and selling into potentially a falling market. What if the buyers aren't there? Then your only option is to lower your price. Um, whereas splitter blocks hedge your bets because often you can buy a splitter block and get this, 26% of properties in Australia are splitter blocks. And often the owners don't know that they're splitter blocks. Um, sometimes they do, but either way, there are a lot of splitter blocks and usually the house is on one part of a splitter block. So we've seen many members of our community renovate a house and sell off just that block with the house on it. Sometimes they may have to have have a CDC complying development to move a garage or move part of a structure onto the block. And then they can sell that off that pays for itself. And sometimes they've got one or two other blocks and they can then sell them separately. They can um, 
do a DA. They can sell it with a DA as a house and land package or they can actually build the second site. And the second block is usually money for jam and that's where you're talking not just your five um, low six figures for a renovation but multiples of that, multiple six figure profits because you've created a whole other title and block. And they're quick and easy if you know how to find them and where to look. So that's strategy number one. Strategy number two that some of you may heard of, have heard of that is popular in a down market is vendor finance. So vendor finance, so you might have heard of it called creative finance, is ways to structure a deal because sellers are motivated. Um, so sellers... Um, a year ago, could just put the property on the market, fly it up the flagpole, see who salutes, and lots of people would come out and they'd all bid and the price would go up. Now there are more sellers than buyers, not because they're panicking, just because um, there are fewer buyers and naturally properties do come on market, um, whether it's a deceased estate, um, whether someone's downsizing, whether um, they have to or want to sell or they're moving, people will always want to sell their home even in a down market. But if the buyers aren't there, they're going to be more motivated. So vendor finance terms, as the name says, is where the seller offers some finance. So they can be really attractive if you haven't got a deposit. So deposit finance is where, say, the bank will lend you 800000 and the property costs a million dollars. The seller can leave $200,000 in the deal with a caveat or a second mortgage, some strategy um, that in principle means that you can can um, have the seller fund your purchase of the property. And of course, they get paid interest on that um, and that's an income for them as well. And they've got security over the property. And when prices go up, which eventually they will with capital growth, um, you can refinance and pay them out. Another way to do vendor finance is lease options. Or you may have heard of rent to owns um, where you rent the property, but you have an option to buy the property later on down the track. They can't sell it to anyone else. And now you probably pay above market rent, but some of that will be like principal and interest. It will go um, to chip away at the purchase price when you, if and when you go to buy in the future. So lots of strategies around vendor finance and creative ways to structure deals in this market. A joint venture is another one. Um, the homeowner has the home. Um, you have some expertise to do it up or pay for a renovation or subdivide it and split it. So some Sometimes they can be um, hybrid strategies. And the third one, and this is something that I've been teaching for a while, is distressed property because I personally was in distress um, and I had a lot of property. Good blue ribbon property with DAs, all the heavy lifting done, just couldn't sell it because I was caught short in a turning market. I would have loved someone to come to me, partner with me, finish the reno and the development I was halfway through, do something and instead I was just stuck between the devil and the deep blue sea. So these are strategies um, that were worked when we had the GFC. These are strategies that got me out of trouble um, and out of a deep dark hole of debt during the GFC. And these are strategies that will work now. These two are strategies that I've never taught before. And I am creating programs for these, but it's time sensitive. Um, obviously, we've got eight months or so for a market like this to seize this sort of opportunity where um, sellers are very, very motivated in each of these categories. So I'm creating a course, but I've taken an unprecedented move just for members of our community. And that is, we're going to come to you. I said, what's the fastest way? And I'm pretty fire ready aim. So when you're creating online courses, you have to have development and you have to put it all on a platform and test it and blah, blah, blah. Way too long for this market where things are happening so fast. Rates are rising half a percent every month. Sellers in a spring market are getting more and more motivated, especially coming into Christmas. I said, how can I do it now? And the only way is the old fashioned way, live, in person, up close and personal. So 
we haven't traveled for two and a half years. Um, we've just been live streaming, but we're going to come to you on the ground um, in Melbourne, first of all, on the 17th of September, and then in Brisbane on the 24th of September, and in Sydney on the 15th and 16th of October. And we're bringing our team, our entity partners, to cover all bases because there are legal aspects of this, accounting aspects, um, as well as finance aspects. So we will have um, those experts and professionals there as well. And we're going to share everything um, about these three strategies. Now, because we're squeezing it all into a day, um, especially in Brisbane and Melbourne, I need focus, I need your attention and time matters. Um, so we're taking the unprecedented move. We're not going to do it again, at least this year, but we're going to come to you and I need one day. These are game changing strategies, often with little to no money down that will set you up in property, potentially forever, if you get this right and you get the timing right. And it's the first time I've ever shared it and I'm doing it live because of the time factor. So I need you there the whole day and I need you focused. We're going to cater the whole thing. So there's nothing else for you to worry about except giving it your undivided attention and clearing your diary for that particular Saturday. If you're not in those cities or states, it is well worth flying in for. We have an early bird special for this at the moment, and that is $47. Um, and that's it, fully catered, all the information. I'm also going to give you stuff that I've never given out before. Um, so my list of splitter blocks Australia-wide, so that's 26% of properties in Australia are those splitter blocks. You may not know it from the address or a drive-by. Um, it's not something that you can filter and search for, but it is done that I have and I'll be sharing that with attendees on the day. Um, also vendor finance, the various vendor finance strategies, the clauses um, that you can have in contracts and the documentation to affect those sorts of deals um, and distressed properties. What's happening, um, what's trending there, what's working, that stuff we've been teaching for many years now to thousands of people and impacted and helped tens of thousands of people um, and even more so in this market. A lot of sellers out there um, needing help and I'll show you exactly how to do that. There'll be tools, resources, handouts um, and our early bird special is just $47. The only caveat is we've booked those rooms already. Um, the capacity of each of those rooms is 100 people. So it's first in, best dressed um, and once those spots are gone, they're gone. Um, now, I haven't released this generally to the whole community yet. So if um, this is something that resonates with you and if you're free on those dates, so that was the 17th of September in Brisbane, the 24th in Melbourne and the 15th and 16th of October in Sydney, then if you just type yes below in the comments section, we will get that print out and we'll take that offline. Um, and uh, we'll contact you in relation to that event. So um, those spots are going to fill up fast. If you're watching the recording, still type yes in the comments section and one of the team will be in touch if there's still spots available. Exciting times and definitely a state of play that is in a state of flux at the moment. So we'll revisit the economy and the property market and what's playing out this time next month. But but even before that happens, I hope to see many of you, lots of members of our community, up close and personal when we come to you who are um, at this event and share these great strategies that are helping people kick goals right now in this market. See you soon.